ETF Prime is hosted by investment advisors at the ETF Store and sponsored by Leg Mason. Leg Mason's sponsorship is not an endorsement nor a recommendation for any product or service. Leg Mason Investor Services LLC is not affiliated with the ETF Store, ETF.com, or any of its affiliates. The ETF Store is not affiliated with ETF.com or any of its affiliates. ETF.com's participation in this program should not be construed as an endorsement or an indication by ETF.com of the value of any ETF store product or service. This program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. All investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The ETF store owns and is responsible for all program content. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Leg Mason is a leading global investment company committed to helping clients reach their financial goals through long-term actively managed strategies. Leg Mason offers a broad range of equity, fixed income, alternative, and cash strategies worldwide. It is comprised of a diverse family of specialized investment managers, each with their own independent approach to research and analysis, and has over a century of experience in identifying opportunities and delivering astute investment solutions to clients. To learn more, please visit LegMason.com. Now it's time for ETF Prime, where we discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate, Connor, and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of ETF Prime, Nate Geraci. All right, welcome to ETF Prime. As always, I want to thank our exclusive sponsor, Leg Mason. So there was huge news in the world of ETFs last week after what seemed like forever. And then there was actually even a last minute delay on Wednesday. The SEC finally adopted what's known as the ETF rule, more formally called Rule 6C11. And the gist of this is that over the past nearly 30 years, ETFs have basically operated using loopholes and exceptions. I, I thought uh, CFRA's Todd Rosenbluth explained this well to Barron's. He said, quote, each ETF was essentially being treated by the SEC as if it's a snowflake where nothing is the same, and that slows down the process of bringing new ETFs to market. But with this new rule, there will now be a standardized regulatory framework in place for new ETFs and also for existing ETFs in terms of the information provided to investors and how these ETFs operate behind the scenes. The reason this is a big deal is because there are real tangible benefits to both investors and ETF companies. Things like lower costs, potentially lower taxes, more transparency, I, I think more uh, innovation as well. In just a moment, I'll be joined by ETF.com's Laura Krieger. We're going to break all of this down for you. Laura's been covering this story from the beginning. So if you're trying to make heads or tails of this ETF rule, Laura's definitely the right person to help get you up uh, to speed. So we'll start there. And then I'll also be joined this week by Luke Oliver, head of index investing at DWS. He's going to talk investing in China's stock market, and we'll spotlight DWS's lineup of China-focused ETFs, which this is very timely uh, with the news last week that the White House was considering imposing limits on U.S. investment in Chinese stocks. So we'll get into all of that, and then we'll close the show with Sal Gilberti, founder of Tucrium, who's going to take us through their lineup of agricultural commodity ETFs. Uh, so, for example, they offer the Tucrium Corn Fund, which owns corn futures contracts. So Sal will explain how those products work, and we'll also look at some key investment drivers here, including the trade war with China and also the weather this year. Pack show this week. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFprime.com, or you can find us on Twitter at ETF Prime. Let's start by uh, breaking down this ETF rule with ETF.com's Laura Krigger. Time now for our weekly chat with the experts at ETF.com the world's leading independent authority on ETFs. I ran the numbers again for the cheapest ESG ETF portfolio. These are good numbers. Uh, they're not marijuana good, but they're pretty good. If you believe that it's going to save you in the apocalypse, you might want to consider something else. Laura, the SEC at long last released the final version of the ETF rule this past Thursday. Uh, this thing is 259 pages long. 
<laughs> now, I, I know you had a busy weekend with the March for the Fallen, which I do want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. uh, but be honest here. Did you actually read this entire document? I, well, I got most of it done. I still have a few chapters left to go, so don't spoil how it ends. But um, yeah, it, it, it ended up being my uh, my light plane reading to and from the march. So, and uh, actually, funny enough, I ended up uh, explaining and, and discussing the ETF role with a bunch of people I met over the course of the hike. So definitely uh, top of people's minds, even if you're not obsessively watching the ETF market like I am. Well, okay. So for people who maybe aren't as close to the ETF industry or for investors who simply want to better understand the impact of the, the ETF role, I, I guess a good starting point is to explain how ETFs have been operating, right? Because that'll then allow us to highlight why this role is important. So let's start there. Do you want to explain the basics of how ETFs have been operating since 1993 uh, from a regulatory perspective? And then we can get into uh, all the details of this rule. <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, like you said earlier, uh, ETFs have existed up to this point in time as an exception to the rules. Uh, for the past 25, 26 years, if an issuer wanted to get into the business of launching ETFs, they first had to obtain what it's known as, quote, exemptive relief. And that's an order from the SEC essentially saying, it's okay that you're going to bend these rules, and here are the specific ways in which you can bend them, right? But getting this relief order has been kind of a time-consuming process. It's been expensive for issuers. It adds months onto the process of launching an ETF, and it costs, uh, you know, in the early days, it costs upwards of a million dollars. Now it's closer to, you know, a couple 10,000, but that's still a lot of money, right? And it, of course, it clogs up the SEC's pipeline, and, you know, they'd rather spend their time debating the merits of Bitcoin ETFs, I am sure. Um, more importantly, though, these uh, orders have been written and granted on an individualized basis. I believe Todd said something to that effect earlier. Um, that you know ha means that they've evolved over time. So a good example is with leveraged and inverse products, right? So until 2009, the SEC was granting relief for anybody to you know who wanted to 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 launch leveraged and inter inverse products. Nobody's gotten exemptive relief since. 2009. They decided to stop. Nobody's gotten it. So that means anybody who had the relief order already can still launch new funds, but now nobody else can, right? So nobody who's come to the market in the past 10 years can, can launch these funds. So as you can see, this kind of creates an unlevel playing field within the industry. Um, generally speaking, the uh, older orders tended to be more flexible. Uh, so you see the legacy players like State Street and Van well, State Street and BlackRock and Vanguard, uh, you know, they have more capability than the newer folks coming to market. And that wasn't necessarily anything like nefarious from the SEC or anything. It was just an unintended consequence of the fact that their orders have evolved over time. So the ETF rule uh, fixes most of that by saying, yes, okay, we're going to allow ETFs to exist, not as an exemption to the rules, but as an application of this new rule. So now there's this standardized definition of what an ETF is, what it does, and everybody can follow it. There's no more need to apply for exemptive relief when you're uh, launching in a fund. And in fact, the SEC is actually rescinding most of the exemptive relief orders that they've already issued. So I think one of the obvious takeaways here is that for ETF issuers, it'll be easier to bring new products to market, right? Lower costs, um, there's not going to have to jump through as many regulatory uh, hoops. So theoretically, I think that could lead to more ETF innovation, which we can talk about. But I guess beyond that, from the perspective of investors, what do you think are some of the most important benefits of this rule? Right. So one of the things that really jumped out at me and I think is probably the most positive benefit of this rule for investors is that it requires more enhanced reporting on certain trading aspects of ETFs. So now issuers, they have to publish on a daily basis their portfolio holdings. They have to publish historical trading premiums and discounts. They have to um, publish median bid ask spreads over the course of the past month and so on. So like all of this has to be readily accessible and published on the fund's website all in one place no, you know, no hiding that. And I think maybe, you know, you've heard some issuer angst over the logistical burden of providing this information. But to me, 
it's like 100% an unqualified good thing that investors are going to have more transparency into these metrics. You know, more transparency, more data, to me, that's better. You just have to, at this point, make sure that everybody knows what those metrics mean, um, but it's a good thing that they're there. Uh, I, I do want to point out one little exception to that, and that's that the ETF rule kind of does away with the concept of INAV, indicative uh, net asset value. And this was a, a metric that was published uh, you know, every so often during the trading day, uh, every 15 seconds, I believe. Um, and, and it was supposed to provide people a way to see what the net asset value of the fund was during the trading day. And it, you know, it, it did its job. It was good to have it, but I, I don't think it was really that well understood by investors. And sometimes it could get a little misleading uh, when you had uh, price dislocations in the market. Like for example, when the trading hours of the underlying securities were different than those of you know the ETF. Like if you had an overseas fund or something. Um, so you know it could get a little a little misleading in that regard. Uh, also, you know, a lot of liquidity pro providers, they just kind of calculated their own version of the INAV. So, you know, I don't think we're really losing too much by, by getting rid of, of this concept, but I, d I should point out, you know, that it's, it's not there anymore. And Laura, with the additional transparency and disclosure, so you mentioned things like bid ask spreads, premium and discounts, j just to be clear, some ETF providers had been providing this information already on their websites. It's just that now that's a requirement. Oh, of course. Yes. I'd say the vast majority of people in the ETF industry uh, were already providing um, this a lot of this information on their websites. There are a few notable exceptions, though. Um, yeah. And, and one of the things I think is important here, too, is, you know, a lot of people focus on the expense ratio for ETFs. But you do have to look at the total cost of ETF ownership, which does include things like bid ask spreads and, and premiums and discounts. So I, I think exactly. clearly important for investors. What about um, th this ability to use custom baskets. Uh, yeah, that's part a, of the ETF a really rule. good. Do you want to explain what that means and, and perhaps what some of the benefits are? Right. Okay. So a uh, little bit of ETF one hundred and one here. Um, whenever uh, new shares of an ETF are going to be either uh, made or taken off the market, um, issuers rely on what are known as authorized participants. These are special investors who have the ability to make and destroy new shares of an ETF. And to do this, they give to the issuer a, a proportional basket of underlying securities in the ETF in exchange for a fixed number of shares of the ETF called a creation unit. That's if they're going to make shares. And if they're destroying shares, it works in reverse. They deliver you know, a creation unit's worth of ETF shares and they get the underlying securities instead. So generally speaking, the securities that APs have to give and get, they have to be some sort of um, proportional slice of the total ETF portfolio. But some exemptive relief orders, uh, mostly older ones from before 2005, they allowed issuers to, to use what's known as, quote, custom baskets. And these are baskets that differ from that pro, pro rata slice. And there are lots of reasons why you might want to use a custom basket. Um, maybe you have an enormous portfolio, like you're dealing with thousands and thousands of individual bonds. And instead of you know, grabbing a slice of each one of those bonds, you want to use a representative sample instead. Or maybe you're in the middle of a rebalance, right? And you want to um, replace a security from your portfolio with a new one that you like. So you can uh, put the one that you want to get rid of in the redemption basket, and you can put the new one in your creation basket. So using a custom basket uh, tends to minimize issuer's trading costs. It makes your AP's life easier, and it conceivably leads to lower trading, sp trading spreads. Uh, now, the ETF rule now allows everybody to have custom baskets, uh, so long as they publish in writing how this benefits investors and they do, you know, the disclosures that we just talked about. Um, and so that kind of erases the, you know, again, the unlevel playing field. It levels it. Uh, now the newer folks can do the same thing that the older folks were doing. And conceivably, that could, you know, help increase tax efficiency for ETFs kind of across the industry. Laura, going back to a comment I made earlier that it will be easier for ETF issuers to bring new products to market, um, 
what do you think this means for ETF launches moving forward? Like, do you think we'll see an uptick in new launches? And then as I think about potential benefits to end investors, you know, typically more competition um, tends to have the effect of lowering costs as well, right? So, so I guess two questions here. I mean, one, do you think we'll see an uptick in ETF launches because they're easier to bring to market? And then if so, do you think that sort of puts further downward pressure on costs? I think to your first point, uh, yes, I do think we're going to see, um, I don't know if the floodgates are opening, right? But uh, we we will see it be easier for new products to come to market, but specifically new products from new issuers, right? Who may have been kind of gatekept by the time outlay and the cost outlay of uh, coming to market in the ETF uh, industry. So we might see some new names come into the industry over the next you know year or so. Um, as far as bringing down costs, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is just going to intensify the fee wars, right? I, I can't see that it wouldn't. Um, once you get more people flooding into a market, it's all just, you know, that's, I think that's going to be one way that people can distinguish between a whole bunch of new funds, right, is, is their cost. So for sure, yeah. Are, are there any particular areas where you think new launches are more likely uh, so, so, you know, I think about maybe fixed income ETFs or active ETFs, given that custom baskets can, can now be used. Do you think that might be the case? I think, yes. Uh, you know, active certainly will be something that benefits the active uh, ETF space and fixed income ETF space. I actually think we might see more thematic ETFs come to market. Uh, you know, maybe more ESG funds or more, you know, narrow slice tech funds or something like that. I think anybody who's got a good idea now uh, who might have been scared away by this, this barrier to entry, they can come to market now so long as they play by the rules. Okay, so you know that I always like to play devil's advocate anytime we talk <laughs> about pretty much anything. And look, overall, I don't think there's any question the ETF role is being viewed as a huge positive, right? And actually, uh, your colleague, Dave Nottig, uh, he told Barron's last week that this is arguably the most important piece of regulatory action to hit the ETF industry since 1993. And he said, uh, mm -hmm. quote, it's a rare win for both investors and the industry. But I do want to flip this around a little bit. Do you think there are any negatives to this rule or, or maybe things that didn't make it into the final rule that you think should have been included? So rather than, hmm, I think the biggest negative, and it's not even necessarily a negative per se, but it's just something that people need to kind of keep in mind when we're talking about the ETF rule, is that yes, the rule standardizes uh, the process of launching an ETF, but it doesn't standardize it for everybody, right? So there are actually several categories of ETFs for which this new rule doesn't apply. One of them is unit investment trusts. Um, that's an older form of ETF. Uh, most ETFs now are open-ended funds, but when they were first coming to market, uh, the unit investment trust structure was a little bit more popular. Now there's only, I think, like 11 ETFs now that are still unit investment trusts, but they're big, they're huge, right? So SPY is a unit investment trust. Uh, the Qs, a unit investment trust. So they don't have to follow the same rules as the ETF rule. Um, they just follow the exemptive relief order that they have already been granted. That's one of the ones that hadn't been rescinded. Um, the ETF rule doesn't apply to leveraged and inverse products. Um, they still have to apply for exemptive relief on an individualized basis if you want to launch these products. Same thing with um, those new non-transparent active ETF structures that we're seeing, like the ones from Presidian and uh, Active Shares and so on. Um, they're starting to become a bigger uh, deal, I guess, uh, you know, kind of the forefront of the market, um, coming or coming to market, I should say. But those folks have to apply for exempt relief like everybody else. Now, there's one big, big, big category of people um, that, you know, that don't apply or that, uh, that the ETF rule doesn't apply to. And that's um, ETFs, which exist as a share class of another fund, meaning literally all of the Vanguard brand ETFs are exempt from the ETF rule. So I did the math when I was covering, uh, you know, the, the, the rule when it first launched. Um, and while only about 120 ETFs are exempted, those ETFs represent 
over one trillion in assets invested in this industry. That's thirty-seven percent of the total assets. So there's a fair bit of of money that is not going to be dictated by the ETF rule. Yeah, I saw that stat that you put out last week, and I think I made the comment. You know, this is still not entirely a level playing field, right? When you have somebody like Vanguard with over a trillion in assets that doesn't have to abide by all of the same uh, rules here. So so I agree with that. Something else I tweeted out last week that I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Um, the SEC decided to hold off on implementing an ETF naming system. So BlackRock mm -hmm. had put forth this initiative to uh, label products in a way that investors could better understand them. So, you know, for example, leverage and inverse products or exchange traded notes, they would be labeled in a different way. They couldn't be called ETFs. And I, I know that can get pretty hairy trying to determine what goes into to, you know, which classification. But I do think it would help investors, if nothing else, just as a very initial uh, check when, when you're looking at a product to see that it's called something else that, hey, maybe this doesn't behave the same as a plain vanilla ETF. I, any thoughts on that? Were you surprised that that wasn't in the final rule? Uh, I mean, my initial thoughts on it is it felt to me like, and reading through the, the document, you see it kind of uh, specific to leveraged and inverse products, right? There was this attempt by commenters to sort of wall off leveraged and inverse products from being called ETFs. And I mean, they are ETFs. Like they, they functionally, mechanically are the same uh, as, you know, any, they function the same as any other ETF. So it felt a little, not arbitrary, but I just couldn't see the reasoning there. And already there are so many different acronyms and different names being bandied about. It just didn't seem like something that, um, I think the SEC made the right call on that, holding off on on relabeling uh, different segments of the market. Um, no, that's fair. I, I guess, you know, I just think back to like the, uh, the XIV blow up last year. And just because that may have been called something different, that's not going to that wouldn't have prevented some investors from getting bludgeoned there. I just think anything that right. um, can better help people understand, you know, what they're investing in could be a benefit. But I also I read through that that uh, commentary in the SEC document as well. And again, they made the point that, you know, it's really they receive comments. It's really difficult. How do you classify what goes where? It's not as easy as it may look on the surface. Um, OK, so Laura, and I don't think it would. I, I'm sorry. Just yeah, one last ahead. point. I, I don't think it would actually add any more clarity to the market. I think it would just introduce more confusion because now you've got to know what all of these different acronyms mean, right? So, I don't know. Okay, so when will this rule officially go into effect? What's the process here from from now? Right. So, it goes into effect 60 days from when the rule has been published in the Federal Register, and I checked yesterday and I didn't see it there, but it's, you know, very possible it, I might have missed it or it came in afterwards. Anyway, 60 days after that, the ETF rule officially goes live and we are living in the ETF rule world. Okay, so do we think before the end of the year then? Um, you're asking me to do basic arithmetic on air. And of course I can't do that. I, if not the, the end of the year, um, then certainly, you know, in the opening weeks of 2020. Okay. Okay, so uh, before I let you go, I do want to come back around and ask you about uh, the March for the Fallen event that you participated in this past week. And so the team over at Alpha Architect, they do an amazing job um, garnering support for this event. Of course, Wes Gray served as a captain in the Marines. But um, as I understand it, this march honors military servicemen and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. I'm just curious, what was the event like? I, I It's an event I certainly want to attend at some point. I haven't been able to do it the past couple of years, but uh, what was the event like and how did the march itself go for you? Right. So it was, um, it's, it's actually a march held by the, uh, by the broader community. A, a Pennsylvania National Guard uh, general is the one who uh, actually organized the event, founded the event. Um, he doesn't organize it now, but uh, the National Guard has taken it over. Um, so there were about 700 people at this march, and roughly 120 of them were people that Wes Gray had somehow convinced from the financial industry to come do it. And he's he's just a force of nature. If you've ever met him, he's an incredibly charismatic person um, and, and a genuinely good person too. So um, I'm not surprised that he was able to to convince so many people to come. 
Now, the march itself uh, is 28 miles in the Pennsylvania woods. It's held on a uh, National Guard uh, training facility, uh, an actual base. So you're marching along, you know, military equipment and, and training facilities and so on. Um, but most of it takes place in the woods. And there is... I said it was 28 miles. Um, the full version is 28 miles while carrying a 35-pound rucksack. Now, you you don't have to do it that way. Like, there, there are plenty of people who do the 28 miles without the rucksack. And there's also um, a, a much shorter version. There's a 14-mile version, um, which I did that version. And uh, it still was hell on my feet. So <laughs> it was, it was, um, a fun experience. Uh, you know, it was a very, actually very profound experience too. Um, like you said, this is a march to honor, uh, fallen service members, members who didn't come back from their deployment. Um, very much a living memorial quote, living memorial. This is how the general described it to me. Um, so by putting yourself out there by putting yourself in the shoes of the people who, you know, getting, getting kind of a taste of what it's like to, um, exert yourself in this fashion. Um, you know, you're, you're keeping people's memory alive and, you know, at every mile marker, for example, they had, uh, a, a photo and a name of somebody who didn't make it. There was a, a memorial wall at the finish line of names and faces of service members who um, were killed in action. And a lot of the volunteers and participants were Gold Star family members. Um, before the event, there was a, actually a woman who spoke, who was a Gold Star member, um, Gold Star family member whose brother had uh, died by suicide um, while deployed. And she just told us how much it meant to her that, um, that so many people had come out and that so many people were, were dedicated to keeping, um, keeping the memory alive. And just, it was an incredibly profound experience. So I'll yeah, be such an amazing writing event. up my thoughts later. Yeah, yeah. Now I need to make it out to that. Um, one of these years, uh, Laura, we'll have to leave it there. Um, excellent stuff as always this week. I know you've been all over this ETF story or the CTF rule story from the very beginning. Uh, regulatory matters, of course, aren't the easiest thing in the world to make digestible. Uh, right. But I think you've done a great job with it. So thank you. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. That was ETF.com's Laura Krigger. All right, our next guest is Luke Oliver, head of index investing at DWS, who's a global asset manager currently offering over 40 ETFs with nearly $15 billion here in the US, including four China-focused ETFs. DWS was actually the first issuer to offer China A shares in an ETF wrapper, and China will be the focus of our conversation this week. Luke is on the line with us from New York. Luke, great connecting. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Luke, before we talk China, uh, we were actually just discussing the ETF rule with ETF.com's Laura Krigger. I, I thought I'd ask you, any quick thoughts on that? What was your reaction to the SEC finally approving this? I think it was a, a long time coming, and it was it was good to see that the rule that they had drafted and given people the ability to comment on, had they had listened to the comments and they'd listened to feedback from, you know, ETF issuers, investors, and, and market makers and exchanges, and I think they came out with a good rule. I think it was very pragmatic. Um, some of the things that had been proposed that might not have been a good idea had been removed. And even though, as an issuer, we had always had the ability to do custom baskets, that's now been rolled out to everybody, and I think that's, that's a good thing. I think everybody being able to um, build flexible, um, efficient baskets, especially in the fixed income space, is going to increase efficiency for investors and also um, increase competition. So I think, I, think it's, I think it's a good rule. So do you think that was the biggest benefit here was the ability to use custom baskets? You know, if I'm thinking from the investor standpoint and what some of the tangible benefits potentially are, does it derive from the use of custom basket, uh, baskets? Yeah, well, I mean, the rule is a lot of people have asked, oh, what does this mean for investors or, or what does it mean for me as, a, you know, as an investor? And it 
it's really a rule that, that affects issuers. And where it will affect in a kind of secondary derivative, if you like, it will affect investors, is that potentially there will be a lot more competition because it will be easier to access the ETF markets. And then this, the, the custom basket allows you um, to build a basket piecemeal mm-hmm. um, over time using the creation redemption process. It also allows you to rebalance efficiently. And those are two critical um, parts of ETF efficiency that in the past was only open to some issuers and not others. So the fact that everybody can do that, if you're in um, a product that did not have the ability to do that, perhaps you'll see some efficiencies in the future. It'll also enable potentially potentially to have tighter spreads as there's a bit more transparency on how those, those baskets are going to be used. And it means that baskets can be optimized to be more liquid, if necessary, to, to help the product. So investors will see those secondary effects. So for the investor, that is absolutely the biggest difference in there. Um, one thing that you know it's almost not worth dwelling on, there was a proposal to not allow ETFs to create T-1 um, the day, you know, prior day, which I think had come from a, a, a misconception, and you know that would have negatively infect, uh, affected investors. But that was resolved and through the process. So the, the whole process works. Anything that wasn't going to work for investors was weeded out, and um, I think I think we ended up in a good place. Okay, Luke. So we're going to focus on China this week. Obviously, China has been front and center with the trade war. Uh, of course, last week there was talk of the White House considering imposing limits on U.S. investment in Chinese stocks. And I want to get to uh, both of those things. But let's start with an area that I think causes a lot of confusion among investors, which is simply understanding the structure of the Chinese stock market, right? Because there are all these different share classes, A shares, B shares, there's something called red chips. So let, let's maybe start there. What are some basics to understanding the structure of the Chinese stock market? So first of all, it's understanding why. And that is is that China had for many years, many decades, been very close to the outside world from a capital perspective. And that meant that Chinese companies would have to try and seek alternate ways to raise capital in the global capital market. So that led to this effect of companies going overseas and, and being creative about where they list and raise raise money and how they incorporate and things like that. So that led to all these different share classes cropping up. And thankfully, as those markets become more and more open, it's going to look more and more like a t- traditional country stock market, which is that there will be um, stocks listed in the home country like we do in the US or most, most other developed, in fact, most other countries, period. But what's so, so let's just kind of break down the landscape in China. Um, the biggest group of shares in China are the A shares. These are Chinese companies that are listed, incorporated in China, listed in China, mainland China, on the Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges. These are your, um, uh, they, they tend to be some of the older companies in China, but there's also plenty of um, you know new and innovative companies also listed in those markets. And it makes up the biggest market cap. Uh, over a third of Chinese market cap is in this market. Uh, there's over 3,000 stocks trading there. This is the big, the the big part of the market that had until recently been closed off to outside investors. The next most relevant um, share class are the H shares, H for Hong Kong, and the these are companies that are incorporated in China but have listed in China uh, in Hong Kong, which now obviously is is is, uh, is an extension of China, but at the time um, you know wasn't the case. So H shares are traditionally what investors have been buying when they are targeting China, because that's the closest you could get to a Chinese stock was the Chinese incorporated company listed in Hong Kong. And they they make up uh, about 18% of the market cap of China. So they're the big two that make up over half of the the Chinese market. But then it gets quite interesting. You've got, you mentioned um, uh, red chips. Red chips are often state-owned or controlled Chinese companies that incorporate outside China but then list back in Hong Kong. So it's another share class. Um, P-chips is another big one. Um, it's about 16%, so, so one of the, the, the third biggest in size. P-chips are Chinese companies incorporated outside China, listed in Hong Kong, but the difference between P and red chips is that the P-chips are often owned by private sector individuals. So they're, they're, the, they're, they're all the, the major you know, Hong Kong and, and China listed companies. But then you've got this other interesting one that has grown in significance in recent years are the N shares. And N is for New York. They are companies like Alibaba and Beidou who have listed in New York. So Chinese companies incorporated in China but listed in the U.S. And that's 
those companies have obviously, you know, you know those stories. They've been incredibly successful and um, are a very large part of now over 15% of the market cap comes from these N shares. They're listed in New York, which is quite quite incredible. So there are a few others. There's also, you, you mentioned B shares, L shares, S shares. The list goes on. But the ones I just mentioned are the real make up, you know, the vast, you know, 90 odd percent of the uh, market cap of China. Luke, if we were to try to boil that down from the perspective of investors, are, are there any really critical differences here? So I get that these companies are listed in different places, some are incorporated in different places, some, right? Some are offshore. But w- what does that mean from an investment standpoint, just at a high level? Well, at the highest level, and I think the most important level, is that all the stocks aren't in one place in one share class. And that means that if you buy just one of these share classes and investors for many years, and not just investors themselves, but the portfolio managers of, of various funds, have always accessed the eight shares as the main driver of accessing China. So the, the issue with that is that any one share class might not represent the Chinese economy. They might represent a certain type of company that has chosen to incorporate and list in a certain type of way. And that doesn't necessarily speak to the type of business it is. It, it seeks, speaks to the way that that company has, has um, accessed the capital market. So, for example, um, when investors are targeting China, but they're buying H and N, you might find that they've got very few stocks to choose from. And you end up with a skewed view of China or a very concentrated view of China. So you might be overweight financials and not just overweight the sector, but overweight one or two really enormous mega cap stocks. So the the problem with this uh, ability to access, or historically the ability to access only a few share classes, meant that people weren't really getting a good view on China, and it, they weren't really choosing Chinese stocks. They were the Chinese stocks were choosing them by listing under these share classes. So the opening up of the A shares to global markets just a few years ago is what's really driving. Um, like the normalization of investing in China. So high level, the fact that they're separated into these share classes has made it difficult for investors to understand exactly what they're getting when they try and buy a China exposure, and that's changing now. So is it fair to say the A shares are most representative of the Chinese stock market? Yes. Well, I mean, the most representative would be to invest in all of these share classes, agnostic of, of the, the, the share class, because that's how you invest in the U.S. When you invest in, um, you know, large cap U.S. stocks, nobody talks you through, well, which which exchange and which market and which where were they incorporated? They, they, these are just U.S. stocks listed in the U.S. Um, so so the, the real way to look at China is to, to, to build an index across all of the share classes. But certainly, if you had to pick one, the A share gives you the broadest um, spread of, of shares. So just to put it into context, um, as I mentioned before, there's over 3,000 stocks listed in Shanghai and Shenzhen that make up the A shares. Uh, the benchmark that we look to is uh, the CSI 300. So it's a broad benchmark that gives you that, that diversification. In context, the one of the major indices tracking the H shares, which has been the traditional China, China vehicle, only holds 50 stocks. And it shows those 50 stocks out of 150 that are listed in Hong Kong that chose to list in Hong Kong. So there's, it's a very different view. So yeah, I, I definitely think A shares gives you the the broadest view on China. Well, on that note, let's take a look at the D, uh, DWS lineup of China ETFs. And I thought we might start with the X Trackers Harvest CSI 300 China A shares ETF, ticker symbol ASHR. This was the first US listed ETF offering exposure to China A shares. And it's currently DWS's third most popular ETF, and actually one of the most popular China ETFs overall. Uh, tell us about this ETF. Uh, it's a great, great ETF. And we're, we're very privileged to to have this product. It's, it's, it's one of those products that almost is the price discovery for China A shares outside of Chinese markets. It's uh, 1.7 billion in size. Uh, it tracks a broad benchmark. Um, and we've been out since uh, 2013. And so where this, this came about was this idea that we were, mo- we're always monitoring global markets, looking for opportunities. And China had recently started to open up its markets. And it wasn't until 2012, or actually late 2011, that they opened up a a, um, a quota system called RQ fee, which was an improvement on the previous Q fee, which had been around for, for 10 years prior. But RQ fee allowed daily liquidity. So we sat up and said, this must be, this is a structure that 
provides enough liquidity to build an ETF. And so we, we built ASHR um, and, and got that to market to be the first. So it was a great story to be the first to market. You know, who would have thought? I mean, we were almost, uh, you know, seven or eight years out since since the launch. But it was amazing even back then to find a new market that hadn't been tapped and be, be first to market with that with that fund. So it's been it's been incredibly successful. Um, it's it's a great ETF, it, and, and by great I mean it does all of the things that a good ETF does, which means it's got assets, it's highly liquid, it has options chains. Um, people use it to short, so you can lend it and make additional revenue um, on lending it. And its performance has been. Um, versus the other China funds has been great because those A shares have really held up well through this whole period of volatility that we've seen versus the um, the H shares. Just for a little bit of um, uh, context, we've seen the you know year to date the and this is as of as yesterday CSI was up uh, sorry the A share was up twenty two point nine eight percent versus the you know the large each share ETF out there is up 1.96, so incredibly different returns. And that doesn't come from the A being better than the H. It comes from the diversification and just the the breadth of companies that you pick up that has picked up more performers in um, in those markets. So it really speaks to that story for Asia. And there's also a, a small cap version, correct? Ticker ASHS. This holds the next 500 companies in terms of market cap. Is that right? That's right. It, this, uh, this is the CSI 500, so it's the 500 stocks after the, the CSI 300. Um, and it's been a, it's, it's been a, it's been a good performer as well. It's also been you know more volatile. It really kind of speaks to the smaller cap story, um, and that, that gives investors access to that that um, mid and small cap universe of Chinese stocks, which could be very interesting. Um, like much of the rest of the global markets, the last year or so has really been a, a, a large cap story. But the from a from a size factor perspective, this gives you that um, that size, and and I think that um, it just to put it into context, that one has raised about fifty million, so a lot smaller than its um, its uh, sister in in A share at one point seven billion, but um, a lot of growth to come on that, and I think I think especially as we as if we reach some kind of trade deal, I think we could be um, off to an interesting ride with AS, ASHS. And then uh, briefly here, two other China ETFs that DWS offers are the X Trackers MSCI China A Inclusion Equity ETF ticker ASHX, yep. and then the X Trackers MSCI All China Equity ETF ticker CN. Do you want to give us a quick rundown on those? Sure. Well, well the the first one you mentioned, the Inclusion Index um, ASHX, that is similar in in characteristics to ASHR. Um, where they where they're different is that the ASHX tracks the stocks that the MSCI benchmark will be adding into their index. So this gives people a exposure to um, specifically those stocks. And the reason that's interesting or important is we've long told people that they are completely underweight China. Even if they have allocated to emerging markets, their emerging markets will be underweight China because these A shares have historically been excluded. So you really want to include and think about including some A shares to complement that. Now, some specific clients are particularly interested in the exact Chinese companies that MSCI is adding because they want to complement their MSCI benchmark exposure. So that's where we brought out that. that. It's another sister product to, to ASHR. So similar in, in, uh, in most ways, although it's just finely tuned to be exactly like MSCI. But CN that you mentioned is perhaps you know the, the kind of greatest unsung hero of all of these products in that it does exactly what we said at the beginning a China exposure should do, which is give you access to all of these share classes. So it gives you the A shares, the H shares, the red chips, the P chips, the N shares, and the other share classes in their market cap weight. So this fund, CN, ignores the fact that there's these different share classes and just says, show me all, this, all the Chinese companies, and then we'll run our index process, the MSCI index process, over those. And we won't take into account where they're listed, where they're incorporated. They're Chinese companies. They'll be in this index. And you end up with a bit more diversification, but you get that true look and feel of what China really is. And that is that it it includes the sectors of all the Chinese companies, includes the diversification of all the Chinese companies across all the exchanges. And that's, for me, that's the product of the future. And so when I look at the lineup, I think people need A shares now because they're underweight. And the A shares is where... Um, a lot of the story that's developing right now is 
CN is the product of the future that you should be using to position for the fact that at some point, whether we like it or not, China will be the biggest economy in the world. And it will probably be its own allocation in your market, in much the same way that most foreign markets have a USA sleeve in their portfolios. China will have to be part of our uh, standalone um, exposure at some point in the future. Luke, can you talk at all about potential capacity constraints to investing in China? So we saw this news last week that the White House was considering putting limits on uh, U.S. investment in Chinese stocks. How big of a concern is that? And then what about limits the other direction, right? Could China well, put further constraints in place on foreign investment? Yeah, well, well, it's funny. It's funny. So if you go back to 2002, China almost wouldn't accept your money. You, you, it was China stopping the, the world investing in, in China. And it was then in 2002 they started this QFI program I mentioned earlier, and they opened up $300 billion of quota to institutional investors to access Chinese stocks. Fast forward to my story about Asia, 2011, they announced that there was they were going to create RQFI, which is the R was for um, Rimnimbi, Qualified um, Foreign Institutional Investor um, Quota. And that was almost two trillion Rimnimbi was released. That's about about another three hundred billion in uh, in dollar terms into into China. And that was where we we started our product. And lots of different funds opened up um, in Asia as well, and in in the U.S. and in Europe, accessing China. Now, we we then served as one of the kind of first conduits into China for U.S. investors. But if you kind of take this forward, even up until you know two thousand fourteen, two thousand fifteen. China opened up even more, and they, 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 they created this program called Hong Kong Connect, which allowed daily liquidity in and out of China, both ways, northbound and southbound, money in, money out, and had a 16 billion renminbi per day quota for the whole street, so a shared quota. You didn't have to apply for your own quota like we did for our QFI. Anybody could access this if you could access Hong Kong. So suddenly there was this huge daily amount that was opening up to the market. And all of these things allowed MSCI and FTSE and others to realize that China was now accessible and started to include Chinese stocks into indices, which has led to this shift of money towards China over this, this period of time. So what, what I'm getting at is there's an irony here that China has increasingly opened up and opened up. And actually, the most recent news was just a couple of weeks ago, is that the RQV program removed the quotas, meaning that if you have a license, an RQV license, you can trade as much in and out of China as you'd like, and there's no limit on it. So China is incredibly accessible. So from a capacity perspective, we used to tell people in 2012, uh, at a billion dollars of inflows, we would start getting nervous about requesting more quota from the regulators. We had to do that a couple of times. Today, we've got almost infinite capacity. It was one of the most liquid markets um, in the world. We have no cap on accessing through either our quota, which isn't a quota anymore, our license, and this Hong Kong Connect. So all of those things are going very well and very very little uh, capacity constraints. This news recently, and the irony being that China keeps opening up more and more, and now we're hearing this news about maybe the U.S. is going to try and limit the flow into China. Um, so that would be the only thing to to um, would put a dampener on this this move of money in, into China. But given what we've heard, that you know, the the kind of the most likely approach to this would be looking at comp- Chinese companies that are listed in the U.S. that refuse to um, have U.S. auditors review them. So that kind of cuts down, that kind of scales down what's in scope for that for this initial headline. And I think we've kind of really pulled back in the news in the, in, the, in the last couple of days on what that, that really means. So at this point, I don't see anything being implemented that's going to put any um, bottlenecks around accessing China. I think China continues to open, and I think indices continue to add China to, to their benchmarks. Luke, we have just a couple minutes left here. In terms of the investment case for China moving forward, obviously the trade war has been in the headlines. I think along with that, there have been concerns over China's economy slowing down and uh, p- perhaps cooling a bit. What's the base case at DWS? What, what's the outlook moving forward, just at a very high level? Yeah, well, we think that um, we still think that the growth is fairly robust, lower than it's it's been um, in the past. But we're we're slightly up on our forecast uh, to six point two percent 
for, for GDP growth in 2019 and 6% for 2020. So put that into context with the US, we're looking at 23 and 2% in 19 and 2020, respectively. So we still think there's a lot more growth in, in China than there is in, in the US. So I think that's still very positive. Um, and, and China is also really taking very seriously the, the fact that they need to inject liquidity um, to, to maintain stable markets, whether that be through tax cuts, um, uh, VAT cuts, things like that, uh, fiscal spending, things that are going to um, you know, get the economy through this, this, uh, this volatility. But that said, like I mentioned, A shares have performed very well this year, up 20%. So China has been strong. They've got the ammunition, if you like, to support their economy through through this, and they've kind of used Draghi-like language in you know doing anything that possible to ensure economic stability. So we think that story is pretty good. And then just at the highest level, this is going to be the largest economy in the world, and this is a story that ha- this is a market that has not been accessible until relatively recently, and. We continue to see this this economy growing. It's moved away from being a, a big exporter towards being a, a service-based economy. I think over 50% of the GDP comes from, um, you know, internal service-oriented activity. This is um, I, it's, it's a very compelling story to to include China. And the, I guess the last word on that is that it's just too big to ignore. Well, Luke, I think that's the perfect ending spot. Uh, Excellent overview on China and the Chinese stock market. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. You got it. Thank you so much. That was Luke Oliver, head of index investing at DWS. We're now pleased to be joined by Sal Gilberti, founder of Cookrium, who offers five ETFs focused on agricultural commodities. Sal is on the line with us from Burlington, Vermont. Sal, thanks for joining us this week. It's a pleasure. So, Sal, we haven't had you on the uh, podcast before, so I'd love to start just by hearing more about your uh, background, perhaps how you got involved in commodities and ETFs and how you ended up founding Tukrium. Sure. I uh, well, I started in commodities a very long time ago with Cargill, actually in their energy division, trading uh, petrol, leaded gasoline, actually, and um, that morphed up over the years into my uh, starting the ethanol contract, which is now the the cleared swap on the on the exchanges. And when I launched that contract, I um, got involved in trading many different commodities, all related to uh, corn and ethanol and soybeans. Um, and I realized when ETFs came along, I didn't invent them, but that they were a terrific package into which you could insert commodities. And grains were not represented. In those days, um, you had, of course, oil and you had the big um, uh, gold ETFs and, and, and metal ETFs. But no one had, had done grains, which shocked me. Now, coming from Cargill, maybe I, I have a skew towards agriculture. But the bottom line is, I saw this as a perfect vehicle, the ETF structure as a perfect deal vehicle to provide investors with a means to get exposure to ags in their portfolio without having to trade futures, which are complicated and most people are not allowed to trade, even institutions. Okay, so right now, Tukrium offers four ETFs covering corn, wheat, soybeans, and sugar. There's also a fund of funds, ticker symbol TAGS, T-A-G-S, which owns all four of these ETFs. Let's take the Tukrium Corn Fund, ticker symbol CORN, which, by the way, you have great ticker symbols on uh, all of these products. Now, explain, you. How, explain how CORN is constructed. CORN is constructed in that it's, it's in the ETF format. So CORN is, is a uh, Delaware Series Trust. So when an, when an investor buys shares of the CORN Fund, they actually own a piece of a separate legal entity. So there, there's really no credit exposure like in an ETN. That's one of the reasons we chose the ETF format, the exchange-traded product format, if you will. And so your money goes in to the fund. The fund buys as corn futures, which is a benchmark that, that we designed. And um, we manage that futures position for you. It is unlevered. It's perfectly transparent. You can go onto our website every night and see uh, what we hold, what your money bought, what your money holds. You know what it will hold because it's a static benchmark, meaning it's, it's, a, it's a formula and you know what that will be at any point in the future. 
and it's unlevered, which means there's a lot of extra cash in there that earns interest that accrues to the fund. And so it's constructed as a simple, easy way for people to get direct exposure to, in this case, corn, without having to trade futures or go out and buy physical corn. And for the other three single commodity ETFs, wheat, soybeans, and sugar, is it the exact same process there as well? Yes, it is. Same process. So what's the general investment case for owning grains in a portfolio? Because I think some investors might look at these ETFs and, uh, pardon the pun, feel like they're too granular, right? Maybe too niche. <laughs> so, uh, so why consider these? Sure. Well, you, you said the right word, investing versus trading. You, people could choose to trade them, but that's not what we're talking about here. And grains have, have a part in a portfolio in that they help diversify. So commodities are proven to diversify a portfolio and enhance your risk-adjusted returns. When you ask people, when we ask people, what do you own? Do you own commodities? Those who answer yes, they usually know that they own gold. They usually know that they own energy. They do that very intentionally. And many own a broad basket of commodities, which is a proven diversifier. But when we say, well, wait a minute, why do you own precious metals and energy when grains are as integrated into the economy as energy? And it, grains are far less correlated to the S&P 500 than gold. Over long periods of time, we do a 20-year study. You can find it on our website. Um, grains actually have, depending on what, which one you're talking about, grains or sugars, between a 0.25 and a 0.33 correlation. Of, of, well, let me put it this way. They're one-third to one-quarter less correlated than gold is to the S&P 500. They're a far better diversifier to the S&P 500. What about the volatility? What sort of ride should investors expect uh, investing okay. in agricultural commodities? Yeah. You're going to get the same price volatility. But the point on agricultural commodities or any commodity is that you're taking out of your, you know, if you take a 60-40 portfolio, you're not taking out of your 40, your stable part, your bond. You're taking out of your um, securities portfolio, so your volatile parts. You're replacing one volatile thing with another volatile thing. And because the commodities don't correlate, and in particular grains really have low correlation to the S&P 500 versus almost all the other commodities, and most especially the metals and oil, um, they will diversify because they'll give you better just returns. In other words, they dig when the stock market zags in general. What about the more specific investment case uh, to own grain? So what are some key potential drivers longer term, more of the macro case? Okay, um, we'll start with, well, first off, Grains have been proven in the last in twelve in the last twelve ten percent or more downturns of the S and P five hundred. Grains outperform the S and P five hundred eleven of those times, sometimes very significantly. And why do they do that? That gets to population is growing. We're using more grains. Grains are everywhere. People really don't um, understand when we say to people, "Why do you own oil in your portfolio?" They say, "Well, I drove to work. I you know I turned my thermostat up or down. Everything that got into my store got there by truck and it used energy." Yeah, that's all true. But, you know, if you pull into a service station, we use the example of this in the United States, to fill up your typical SUV in the United States, you're using about a bushel of corn. That's corn's number one use in the United States is for ethanol component of gasoline. It's actually the number two use in the world. Number one use across the world is to feed animals. So if you eat meat or animal products of any kind, if you drink milk, all of that is an indirect use of, of grain. If, you jump, if your kids jump out of the car while you're at that service station and uh, grab a, something to drink, that's probably sweetened by corn syrup, corn's number three use. If you're using paper, if you're taking notes on this right now, that's corn's number four use, cornstarch. Corn is everywhere. It's impossible to be on the globe in any country doing virtually any activity and not use grains. What does uh, supply and demand look like, right? So we know the global population continues to increase. Uh, there, there's less arable land and, and water. So what, what is that doing overall to the supply and demand dynamics? Uh, it keeps it in a somewhat delicate balance. At any given point in time, we have about a half a year supply of wheat in the world if crops were to stop growing. Uh, we have about uh, two to three months of corn and soybeans. And so that's a very delicate balance. You know, in, in gold, every ounce that's ever been mined and not shot into space is still here. It doesn't rot. It's easy to store. Um, in, it, with grains, they go bad after three or four years. You can't store them. And they're, they're, the, they're subject to, you know, the earth, the globe's growing cycle. So they're subject to winter and summer. In summer, you're growing crops. When you harvest those crops, there's a big pile on, you know, on the ground or wherever. And then for the rest of the year, you're taking from that pile. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. At the end of the year, until the next harvest, that's what's important, until the next harvest, 
you don't know how much you're going to have. And every single year, the combined use of corn, soybeans, and wheat is either a record or the second highest every single year globally. That's that's an immense, immense um, topic that people kind of ignore. We're using record use all the time. It doesn't abate. And sometimes there's a weather disruption. So you've got supplies that are relatively tight in that you have to grow them every year to have enough for the following year. We do have enough. We always have enough. But sometimes the supplies get tight and people get nervous. And in the last 12 years, in fact, since the 2007 Energy Act, when we started using ethanol in our fuel, which doubled the price of corn permanently, um, corn prices have doubled from their break-even price. And there's the secret to ags. Ags trade at their cost of production, because every country subsidizes their farmers. Every country needs to be assured that its people can have food. So farmers are actually used to operating in a break-even environment, and agricultural products, in particular the grains, in particular uh, corn, let's just use that as an example, that will trade between 350 and $4 a bushel. It's been doing so since 2007. That's a break-even. Prices rarely go below that historically. When it stops raining, it, you know, in just one small part of the world for, for one growing season, we've had the prices double twice in the last 12 years. So you layer things into your portfolio, particularly grains, when they're trading at break even. Historically, you've got a very limited downside. So they're, you know, they're going to diversify. They're going to do very little damage if, if they do push a little lower. And when it stops raining, they, they literally, the prices go higher very dramatically and they can add to your portfolio it's performance. Uh, Sal, uh, again, on the macro side of the equation, obviously you can't talk about agriculture without talking about the weather. And longer term, uh, climate change is a concern. Uh, We've seen shorter term disruptive events like the flooding in the Midwest earlier this year. I I think everyone understands the critical role weather plays here, but can you maybe offer some additional context? Sure. Um, Weather is getting more and more dramatic. We see uh, we saw this spring. We saw a pretty significant rise in soybean and and corn prices in the United States because it didn't rain enough. It did. Sorry, it rained too much. And typically it rains rains too little, but it rained too much. And farmers had trouble getting into the field. The crops are actually late this year. Um, And so weather of all kinds, be it too wet or too dry, it's generally too dry, can directly affect um, prices and you know an easy way to think about it is if you're in a big city and you're you know you're getting your bagel every morning for breakfast if it doesn't rain in Kansas or the Dakotas you're still going to get your bagel but guess what there's not going to be much wheat to make that bagel that means steady demand with an uncertain supply you know it's a basic econ 101 scenario and when you look back in history the, the prices do move pretty dramatically up from their break-even levels which is where they trade normally what uh, what about the trade war with China? We were actually talking uh, China earlier in the show. I know soybeans in particular have been in the news quite a bit. H- how big of a concern is the trade war? Um, well, for, for the farmers affected directly by it, it's a huge concern. For investors, it's actually opportunity. The headlines are masking the fact that, you know, that China needs the United States soybeans. And in fact, the, you know, every time there's a supposed thaw in the negotiations or some progress in the negotiations, the Chinese announced they're making a good faith purchase of soybeans. That's complete PR. They need the soybeans. They need our soybeans. They bought all they can from Brazil and Argentina, that are the two largest exporters of soybeans besides the United States. They need to come to the United States. In fact, Argentina is actually an importer from the United States of soybeans now. They've, they've literally run out of beans. And so the, the trade war is providing opportunity in that the headlines are masking an opportunity in that United States soybeans will be sold. They will be sold somewhere to other parts of the earth. There's just a temporary, uh, if you will, um, uh, logistics disruption. And those soybeans are going to find their way to the people who need them, and they're going to be sold by farmers, and demand is still there. And, in fact, this is the second year in a row for both soybeans and corn where globally we will use more than we produce. And in corn in particular, we will use more corn than we produce this year globally for the second year in a row. That's a tightening balance sheet. It's an opportunity potentially for investors. Sal, we have about two minutes left. Going back to the ETFs, I did want to ask you, um, the expense ratios on the four single commodity ETFs are all in the neighborhood of 1.1%. But if you look at some outside resources, I've seen where you can see a fee of around 3.6%. What's the distinction here? And can you talk about how these products are priced? Sure. Um, if you look at an ETF, go to their prospectus. That is a definitive 
uh, uh, source of what you as an investor, what it will cost you to buy and hold that, that ETF for a year, not just our funds, but any ETF out there. Many uh, websites source data from um, providers that only look at gross expenses. So they don't look at, at, say, interest earnings, as in our case, where interest will offset expenses for an investor, or waived fees, where, where very often we waive fees. We take our management fee and pay the expenses of the fund on behalf of the investors to keep to keep the, uh, you, you know, the fund norm, the, the fee normalized to investors. So all investors should really use, no matter what website you're looking at, go to the prospectus of the ETF. You should do that anyway to study the benchmark so you really know what you're owning. And whatever it says in the prospectus, that is what you should use as your, as your fee schedule. Well, Sal, great primer on agricultural commodities and ETFs this week. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks very much. That was Sal Gilberti, founder of Tookrium. That'll do it for this week's ETF Prime. I want to thank our exclusive sponsor, Leg Mason. You can visit legmason.com to learn more about their broad range of investment strategies. If you enjoyed this week's podcast, we would greatly appreciate if you could drop us a quick review wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps other listeners find the show. You can also send us comments on Twitter at ETF Prime. Thanks for joining us, everyone.